Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the mechanism of action of uh, botulinum neurotoxins. So, so far we've discussed um, we discussed the structure of botulinum neurotoxins in general, and there are lots of different types of botulinum neurotoxin, which we'll discuss later. Um, but in general, they all have a heavy chain and a light chain, and the heavy chain is the one that's going to bind to the axon terminal of the neurons. So let's draw this happening. Ooh, not on that side. Um, so, I'll get some more paper. Right, so, uh, let's, um, let's have our axon terminal here. Okay, and now let's discuss how uh, this botulinum neurotoxin is going to actually bind to, um, is going to actually bind to the neuron. Well, basically, in the cell membrane of the neuron, there is what is known as a ganglioside that uh, the botulinum neurotoxin is capable of binding to. So, uh, let's have it in here. Okay, so in the membrane of the axon terminal, shown in orange here, there is a ganglioside called GT1B. Okay, so this is a molecule in uh, the cell membrane that uh, the botulinum toxin is capable of binding to. Okay, so here comes our botulinum toxin. And specifically, it's the heavy uh, chain of the botulinum toxin that binds to this GT1B ganglioside. So I don't know why I've changed colours, but I think I have. Um, yes, I think I've, I'm denoting them in the exact opposite way that I denoted them previously. So we've swapped over. Green now represents the heavy chain, and pink now represents the light chain. Okay. So, the botulinum toxin is binding to this GT1B, and this is what's known as a ganglioside. So I think I'll discuss with you a little bit what a ganglioside actually is. Basically, it's a lipid molecule. It's a specific example of something known as a glycosphingolipid. Okay, so it's a glycosphingolipid. Sphingolipid. So let me discuss with you what that actually means. Now, basically, in order to discuss what a glycosphingolipid actually is, I need to discuss with you what the structure of a molecule known as sphingosine is. Sphingosine. Okay, now the proper name for sphingosine, or the chemical name for sphingosine, is 2 amino, 2 amino, 4 octadecene, octadecene, decene, one free dial. Okay, now sphingosine might sound cooler than 2-amino-4 octadecene one free dial, but the nice thing about this name that chemists came up with is that this tells you exactly what the structure of this molecule is. So, basically, it's an 18 carbon molecule. Don't worry, I'm not going to draw 18 carbons out. Because the only carbons that are actually interesting are the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So let's draw out the first five. And you might be wondering, well, why do I need the fifth? Well, because this decene, that means that you've got a double bond at some point. This tells you it's on the fourth carbon, but that means it must be between the fourth and the fifth carbon, basically. So that's why the fifth carbon becomes important. Okay, so the rest of it we'll draw in a moment. So, what do we know? We know of the first carbon we have a hydroxyl group. Okay, so that's our one free diol here. It also means we have a hydroxyl group of the third carbon. So, okay, these two groups have come from that one free diol on the end there. Okay, we also know that we have this 2-amino here, so that means we have an amino group of the second carbon here. So this group here has come from this bit of the name. Finally, we also know that we've got this octadecene, and it's off the fourth carbon, so that means we have a double bond here. And that basically is all the interesting things about this molecule. So 4-octadecene is this m double bond here. Okay, right, so now all we need to do is put the rest of the carbons on and then just bind everything else to hydrogen. So we've put on five carbons. Octadecene means that we should have 18. So we've got 13 left, basically. So that means we're going to have to have 
um, we're going to have to have 12 methylene groups and then a final methyl group on the end. So, because I don't want to have to draw out 12 methylene groups, what I can do is put one methylene group in a bracket like this, and then put 12 at the bottom to denote repeat this 12 times, and then finally I'll just have to draw out the final one, because that's not a methylene group, that's a methyl group. So that's a nice trick, basically, and let's just check afterwards that we've got enough carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12, which will give us to um, 17, and then 18, so that's done, basically. Now, we just need to saturate everything here, so we just need to add on hydrogens wherever there's a free bond. So there's free bonds off both of these, there's also a free bond off this, so let's put a hydrogen there. Okay, there's a free bond off this carbon, and then there's two free bonds off this final carbon here. So that is the structure of the molecule known as sphingosine. Okay, now, before we can discuss what a glycosphingolipid is, we also need to first discuss what a ceramide is, because a glycosphingolipid is a modified ceramide, basically. It's a sphingolipid where the extra group is a sugary molecule. Okay, right. So now let's discuss what a ceramide is. To make a ceramide, you take this sphingosine molecule, so let's just copy out our sphingosine molecule. Here are five important things, and then we have our methylene group here, okay, which we repeat 12 times. So we'd use our nice tricks so that we don't have to draw out a methylene group 12 times. And then we have this methyl group on the end here. Okay, now uh, we have this double bond between the fourth and the fifth carbon. We have a hydroxyl group coming off the uh, third carbon, an amino group coming off this second carbon, and a hydroxyl group coming off this first carbon, and then hydrogens everywhere else. Okay, so this is the structure of our sphingosine. Okay, right, so um, unfortunately I've forgotten to actually make the modification that we need to in order to turn it into a ceramide. So, to convert it into a ceramide, what you do is you take some carboxylic acid group here. So let's say this is a carboxylic acid, and I'll just put an arbitrary R group there to denote that this could be any old thing here. So we're going to take this carboxylic acid and we're going to form an amide link between this uh, amino group and this carboxylic acid. Okay, so let me draw that. So I'll take this amino group and we'll um, show the modification we're going to make. So here's the amino group here. We take off one of these hydrogens and we take off the hydroxyl group of this carboxylic acid, bind them together to make water, and then we link the carbon here to that nitrogen. Okay, like so. And then we have a hydrogen still off there. So that is what we're going to put in the place of this amino group to turn sphingosine, which I've drawn here, into a ceramide. So ceramide is not a specific molecule. Sphingosine was one molecule, which is why we had this proper name for it. A ceramide is not one molecule because you have this arbitrary R group here. So it's a whole class of molecules. It's an infinite class of molecules. Okay. So, that's what a ceramide is. So what's a sphingolipid, and more importantly, what's a glycosphingolipid? Well, basically, when you take a ceramide to a sphingolipid, so this next thing is a sphingolipid, the next group of sphingosine that you add something onto is the hydroxyl group here. So basically, what you do is you take that proton off, and instead you add on another arbitrary R group. So a well, sphingolipid is basically a ceramide, so you've already got all this happening on this amino group, but now you've also got an extra R prime group off this hydroxyl group. So you've got two ways in which sphingolipids can vary. They can vary in which R group they have uh, coming off the amine, uh, amino group here, and they can also vary in which R prime group they have coming off this hydroxyl group. Now, a glycosphingolipid, glycosphingolipid, basically means that this R prime group here is carbohydrate in origin. It's made up of sugar molecules, okay? And a ganglioside, such as this GT1B ganglioside that we've talked about, is just a specific type of glycosphingolipid. So effectively, it's one of these ceramides with a great big carbohydrate stu uh, group stuck off this um, hydroxyl group here. 
Okay, and these molecules sit in the cell membrane uh, of the cell, and they can have these large carbohydrate groups sort of sticking out into the extracellular space. So it's unlikely that that is what um, the heavy chain of botulinum toxin is binding to. Okay, so now what happens next once the heavy chain of botulinum toxin has bound to its GT1B ganglioside? Well, what happens is that it's endocytosed. Okay, so what will happen is you will endocytose this um, receptor, this GT1B receptor, with, um, the, um, with the botulinum toxin bound to it. So here's the endocytosis process happening. Here's our GT1B uh, protein, well, not protein, molecule, and our botulinum toxin here. Okay, so let me color everything in so we know where everything is. So this here is the GT1B ganglioside sitting in the cell membrane. Here is our, um, our heavy chain of the botulinum toxin. And here is our light chain of the botulinum. Oh, it was in red rather than pink. Here is the light chain of our botulinum toxin. And this is done by clathrin-mediated endocytosis which means that uh, clathrin proteins are polymerizing effectively all the way around here and swallowing that portion of the membrane up. The membrane has no choice, basically, but just, just to mold with this clathrin polymer that's forming here. So loads of clathrin molecules just start binding, and they form this massive great polymer, which has a certain shape that it wants to take on, which has this sort of dome shape, and then the membrane just sort of folds around it to pinch off like that. Okay, so this is clathrin-mediated endocytosis. Clathrin-mediated endocytosis. Now, what will happen is um, the um, vesicle will eventually bud off, and it will be in the cytoplasm of the uh, axon terminal. And also what will happen is that the uh, clathrin coat that you've got, because you totally covered in this clathrin polymer once the vesicle is just formed. That will uncoat, basically. So what you will go to have, the next stage in this, is if this is the axon terminal here, okay, you will have a vesicle, basically, in the, um, in the axon terminal, which just has our GT1B ganglioside here with our botulinum toxin in like this. Okay, so let me color everything in again. So in orange, we have our GT1B ganglioside. In green, we have our heavy chain of the botulinum neurotoxin. Okay, and then in red, we have the light chain of the botulinum neurotoxin. Okay, now what will happen is when you endocytose at anything uh, like this, what happens is the endosome becomes acidified. They start pumping in protons into the endosome. Now, when the pH goes down in that endosome, uh, as it will do because you're making the proton concentration go up, so remember pH, um, a lower pH, like pH 1, means very high proton concentration. So when the proton concentration goes up, that's the pH going down. They're just equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Okay, and when the proton concentration in this vesicle goes very, very high, what will happen is it will trigger a change in conformation in that heavy chain of the botulinum toxin. And what it will do is it will, um, but it will change conformation and it will cleave off from the light chain. But before it cleaves off from the light chain, it will move the light chain into the cytoplasm. So what will happen is the light chain is going to go into the cytoplasm of the axon terminal. Okay? Right. Now, what does this enzyme do, basically? Well, it's going to cleave snare proteins. So, uh, let me draw the snare complex again, and I'll show you uh, the places where uh, the different snare proteins, um, uh, well, sorry, the different botulinum toxins, light chains, cut on these snare proteins. But we'll do that in the next video.